Greetings folk, my name is Don Gordon and today I want to talk to you about some of the experiences that I had as a volunteer working at the RAF Museum Cosford in the UK. First a little about my background. I began my flying as a glider pilot in Newman in 1975. I was fortunate enough to pick up a, a WA state gliding record while I was there. Then in 1977 I gained my unrestricted private pilot's licence and in 91 I was in Florida doing my US ATP at Daytona Beach. 1992 came back to Australia, converted that to an ATPL here. Now I've always loved flying ever since I was a tiny child and in 2014 my wife and I moved to the UK I was able to volunteer at the RAF Museum Cosford from late 2014 until mid-2017. It was a wonderful experience. I was working in a team of four or five people. We were in the test flight and experimental hangar, and I'll talk to you about a number of the aircraft that I was able to work on there. Now, here's a shot of my little friend Threadbare, and I can understand that you're thinking, well, what connection does this have to aviation or to Cosford? My father worked for many years for Trans Australia Airlines. In 1953, we were living in Brisbane and I went along to the TAA staff children's party. Now this was held in a hangar at Eagle Farm Airport and there was a very large Christmas tree set up in one corner or at least it looked enormous to me but then again I was very small and I can still remember that scene very vividly. There was a DC-3 in the hangar, there were uh, Pratt & Whitney R1830s on stands and there was the overpowering smell of avgas, hydraulic fluid and cleaning solvent. Threadbare was the gift that I received that day in 1953 and as you can see I still have him. So what will I be talking to you about today? Well first of all I want to talk to you about the exhibits that I worked on at Cosford. Uh, I've thrown in a few questions for you to ponder. I want to talk about some of the challenges that people working at an air museum face and then I want to talk to you about a couple of the wonderful characters that I met at Cosford. So here's an aerial shot of Cosford. That large uh, silver top building in the centre is the Cold War Museum. So we've got a Vulcan, a Victor and a Valiant in there among a lot of other aircraft from the Cold War era. You can see that there are a number of aircraft still displayed uh, in the open air. For example, the Hercules in the uh, top centre with a VC-10 to its left, a Bristol Britannia right over on the far left side, and then a Nimrod, uh, a, a Neptune, and the Catalina with the red wing. Now, there are two hangars in the foreground there, and the left one of those is the test flight and experimental hangar where my team and I worked. When I was able, I went in on a Tuesday, but I was in fact very busy in the UK with lecturing at the local university and consulting. But nonetheless, every Tuesday where possible, I'd go in and here are the members of the team that I've worked with. So on the left, we've got Keith Bull. Now, Keith's universal nickname was Avro because he'd worked for Avro for many years. Now Keith, when I knew him there, was uh, 84 years old, uh, as sharp as a tack, with a wonderful sense of humour and a very positive outlook on life. He was just an inspiration, Keith. Then we have uh, Pete Rosser, our team leader. Graham Humphreys, a very good friend of mine. Graham Guest, a retired metallurgist. And myself. Now, we're standing in front of the mighty and wonderful and majestic TSR-2. Now, this was an aircraft that uh, first flew in the early 1960s, and its task was to terrain follow at Mark 0.9 at 100 feet, right up to being uh, a Mark II capable aircraft at 40,000 feet. So quite a remarkable range of capabilities. And unfortunately, that aircraft was cancelled by the British government in the mid-1960s. Now, Cosford picked up an enormous variety of aircraft. In fact, as my earlier slide said, there were over 100 exhibits there. 
aircraft, engines, missiles, as well as a lot of miscellaneous stuff and memorabilia. Now, one of the items that came to us was the last remaining Dornier DO-17 flying pencil from World War II. This was plucked out of the English Channel near the Goodwin Sands, and this shot here shows it on, on the barge. Now, when it was brought to Cosford, it was placed in a polytunnel where a weak solution of citric acid was passed over it in order to try to neutralise any active corrosion. Now, I've got a question for you here. This is a photograph taken just near the engine mount of, of one of the two engines on the DO-17. And what I'm interested in is the this cable that shows here, and I'm wondering if you can identify it. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. Well, during World War II, the Germans found that if an aircraft with radial engines like the DO-17 was hit in the engine mounts, sometimes the engine would fall out of the aircraft. Now, the DO-17 was equipped with uh, Brahmo Fafnir nine-cylinder radial engines of about a thousand horsepower and each of these engines weighed about 560 kilograms as installed in the aircraft. Now because they were located well forward of the centre of gravity, if an engine fell from the aircraft it would leave it severely tail heavy and unflyable even though it might otherwise have been able to fly on the remaining engine. As a field modification the Luftwaffe took sections of steel cable and wound them around the engine mounts on the back of the engine and then took them rearwards to the firewall and physically attached the engine to the airframe with these cables so that if the engine mounts were shot away the engine wouldn't fall out of the aircraft. Now I said earlier that I wanted to talk about some of the challenges that people face working at air museums and uh, here are some examples of that. A lot of these older aircraft are riddled with asbestos. And one example here is the P1A, as pictured. This was the first prototype of the English Electric Lightning Mark II interceptor. Now one day, one of my colleagues from the team and I were tasked to enter the cockpit of this aircraft and perform a survey of missing instruments, damaged controls, or anything else that needed doing. And when I sat in the ejection seat, the first thing I noticed was that there was this sort of off-white coloured crumbly material covering one of the ducts on the left-hand side. Now, I immediately recognised this as asbestos, so I hopped out of the, the cockpit with alacrity, and uh, my colleague and I closed and locked the cockpit and immediately reported this problem to the curator of the museum. And in fact, the, uh, the aircraft was sealed off until contractors could be brought in to encapsulate the, uh, the loose and friable asbestos. One very common problem with the older aircraft is that they were designed to be worked on by young and agile people, not people of the average age of our volunteers, which was about 70 at Cosford. Now here's our team leader, Pete Rosser, struggling to extricate himself from the bowels of our beautiful Hawker Hurricane. You can see in the photo the, the trademark steel tube structure that uh, Hawker was using at the time. And this was the only way through this access panel here that you could get in to do work underneath the cockpit, which is what we were doing on this day. Now, Pete was famous for many things, one of which was a most splendid pair of eyebrows. And in fact, you can see the left eyebrow silhouetted in the shot here. Now, I used to kid Pete that he waxed his eyebrows and combed them, and he would never admit that, but we had some good banter around it anyway. Another aircraft that I worked on where we had an issue with uh, awkward and restricted access was the hunting H126. This prototype was built to explore low-speed flight made possible by blowing part of the jet E-flux over the top of the flaps to generate additional lift. Now, in fact, this was very successful on this aircraft, and in fact, with all of the blowing in place, this aircraft had a stalling speed of, wait for it, 28 knots. Now, at 28 knots or a little above, 
you have very little airflow over the control surfaces. So it was necessary to use reaction jets on the wing tips and at the tail to control the attitude of the aircraft. And in fact, what looks like a wing support strut there is actually a duct for part of the exhaust gases to flow out toward the reaction jet on the, uh, the left wing tip. And down the back of the fuselage, you can see that protuberance, which is actually the housing for the tail reaction jet. One day, our team was tasked to enter the rear fuselage and carry out some repairs there. In fact, there was a large diameter duct that passed down the rear fuselage and fed hot exhaust gases to the reaction jets at the tail. And two sections of this duct had become disconnected, so we were tasked to go in there and uh, reconnect them. Now that duct is very fragile, it's only designed to be pressurised from inside, so the designer had thoughtfully provided a rail on either side, so you had to kneel or stand uh, and straddle the, the duct while you were trying to work on it. So here's a shot of me doing an impersonation of a pocket knife trying to get access to this fuselage. I can tell you after a day of working at Cosford doing something like this, it was as much as I could do to uh, flop into an armchair in the evening. Uh, we nearly had to bring Perry Mason in to solve this case. We lost one of our volunteers. He was in another team and he and his fellow team members had been working on a couple of aircraft during the morning and it was noted that he didn't appear in the cafeteria at lunch. So nobody thought anything of it. We just thought, well, maybe he's gone to the crew room to have his lunch there. But in fact, by early afternoon, he still hadn't turned up. So a search party was sent out and eventually we located him in the Neptune. This particular volunteer was of somewhat advanced years, so not too agile and uh, let, let's say a little bit rotund and he'd crawled back into the Neptune and he'd crawled through the space underneath the cockpit to try to reach something in the nose transparency when he became wedged. So he couldn't go forward, he couldn't go back and he couldn't reach his mobile phone. Anyway, eventually we fished him out and all was well. Now a lot of the aircraft that we worked on at Cosford, as you would expect, were quite tall. And uh, here's our uh, magnificent Avro Lincoln. Now, I hadn't been into the Lincoln until this particular day, but I noticed that somebody had unlocked and left open the, the rear fuselage hatch. So I thought, well, I'm just going to go in and have a look, climb up to the cockpit and uh, maybe forward into the nose and uh, have a good look around. And anyway, as I climbed into the nose area, much to my horror, I noticed that the hatch cover had been left off and uh, had I or anybody else fallen through that it would have been about a five meter drop to the ground with uh, probably not very positive results. Now I've also used the Lincoln to illustrate how unseen corrosion can be a problem in older aircraft. I mean if the skin of an aircraft is corroding it's usually fairly readily visible but in this instance here one of the volunteers noticed that the number two engine on the Lincoln had developed a droop. It wasn't sitting at the same angle as the number one. And when this was investigated, it was found that internal corrosion in the engine bearers had caused them to partially collapse and the engine was actually at risk of falling out. So we had to quarantine that area until we could uh, make repairs. Here's the Bristol T-188. This was a research aircraft made primarily out of stainless steel and used in part to determine whether stainless steel was a suitable material to make aeroplanes from. It was designed to fly at Mark II, but it only managed about Mark 1.8. It was powered by two de Havilland Gyron Jr. turbojets, and these were not in a very advanced state of development, but they were particularly thirsty, and that combined with the minimal tankage of fuel that this aircraft carried meant that even on a good day you were lucky to get 25 minutes endurance out of it. So that meant that from the moment of takeoff you had a growing level of anxiety thinking how quickly can I complete the necessary manoeuvres and get back on the ground before we run out of fuel.
So there are two particular issues with this aircraft. Uh, as you can see on the right there, the pitot tube uh, was quite long, and this is often the case with experimental aircraft, because you want the, the furthest forward point of the pitot tube to be as far away as possible from the airframe or any disturbances to airflow. But as you can see from the crowd barrier there, uh, because this thing was at eye height, we had to make sure that none of the visitors could possibly come in contact with it. Now the other part of the aircraft that I've arrowed there is the leading edge of the starboard wing. The wings on this aircraft were very thin and uh, were very sharp at the leading edge. And because of the proximity of the engine, the cell and the fuselage there, with the lighting and everything, it was very difficult to see the leading edge, even though you knew it was there. So I reckon if I'd walked into that full tilt, it would have taken the top of my head off like uh, cutting the top off a boiled egg. So to overcome this problem, I took a strip of high density foam rubber and cut a slot into it and then pushed that piece of foam rubber over the leading edge so that nobody could actually hit their head on the, the sharp metal surface. Now some of the challenges that we faced, the first one, tyres. Now you simply can't put 120 psi into a 60 year old tyre and expect it not to blow up because you're going to be disappointed. So for the aircraft that were moved in and out of hangars for display days, such as the, the Ferry Delta II shown here, those tyres were typically foam filled so that they, they didn't have to withstand that high internal pressure. For aircraft that weren't planned to be moved, the, the wheels would be supported on jacks so that the tyres were not actually bearing the weight of the aircraft. The second thing, radiation from instruments. Because on a lot of the older aircraft, the faces of the instruments and the markings on those faces were painted in luminous paint that was actually radioactive. So, for example, with our de Havilland Comet, there was a prohibition on entering the cockpit because of the level of radiation. And even with the Hawker Hurricane, you were limited to half an hour's work if you were working within one metre in any direction of the instrument panel for that reason. Now, I've shown a photo here of the Ferry Delta II, a magnificent aeroplane. That captured the world airspeed record in 1956, raised it to 1132 miles an hour. And what's very significant about that is that it was over a 30% increase on the previous uh, world airspeed record. And this aircraft was powered by a Rolls-Royce Avon engine. Now, being a Delta aircraft, as you know, Delta, Delta winged aircraft take off and land at a high angle of attack. So the stance of the aircraft on the ground was designed to reflect that. But what it did mean was that the, the top surface of the wings slope rather steeply toward the rear, particularly as you got closer to the trailing edge. So one day my team and I were tasked to wax and polish the upper surfaces of the wings on this aircraft. So I was working there, I was kneeling down, I was facing the front of the aircraft, polishing away, when I started to slide. This is a very slippery aeroplane, and there's nothing to hang on to there. And as the, the wing slope steepened toward the trailing edge, I picked up speed. So I thought, well, this is not going to go well. But I did manage to turn over onto my back so that at least as I shot off the trailing edge, I landed on my feet facing the direction that I was going and uh, everything turned out OK. But uh, it could have been different. It was quite an unexpected thing to happen. Now, I've got a couple of questions for you. I'd like to know what kind of engine this is and what aircraft it powered. Now I can give you a clue here. It's quite old because the photo is in black and white. I don't know how much that will help. So have a think about that for a moment. Well, the answer is that it's an Armstrong Sidley Python and it powered the Westland Wyvern carrier-based attack aircraft. Now this aircraft uh, first flew in the late 1940s, 
and it entered squadron service in the early 1950s and did see combat in the Suez Crisis in 1956. Now, the, the Python turboprop engine was quite powerful, just over 4,100 equivalent shaft horsepower, with 1,180 pounds of thrust coming from the jet exhaust. This, the early versions of the Python engine had a problem in that because of the high acceleration forces during catapult launch from carriers, the engine would suffer fuel starvation and would flame out. This is not what you want for the engine to flame out at the critical part of a takeoff from a carrier because the aircraft goes into the water in front of the carrier, which is steaming at 20 knots plus, and runs the aircraft down. And in fact, quite a number of wyverns and their pilots were lost this way. However, one man survived. His aircraft lost power, the engine flamed out, dropped into the water in front of the carrier, which ran it over and cut it in two. And from underwater, the pilot ejected and he made a successful ejection and survived the whole incident. And as far as I know, that's the only successful underwater ejection that's ever been made. Now, going back to the previous slide for a moment, the Python itself was quite an interesting engine. There was an annular air intake just behind the propellers and all of the mechanism and the gubbins that you can see there is normally covered by a cowling. So the air actually enters the engine through that intake that's uh, just a little over halfway down. Now the air flows radially inwards to the compressor section which is in the core of the engine. It's, it flows forward through the compressors as, it's, as the air is compressed. When it reaches the front of the compressors, it goes radially outwards to the front of the burner cans, which you can see there in the photo, passes rearwards through the cans and mixed with fuel and ignited, and the exhaust from the burners passes over the turbines. So it's uh, quite a unique layout. And they did that apparently to reduce the overall length of the engine, which uh, was still quite considerable, so one can only imagine how much longer it would have been had that uh, double reversal of flow not been done. And in closing today, I'd like to talk about two of the World War II veterans that I had the honour and pleasure to know at Cosford. These two gentlemen, and one other who unfortunately was ill this day, used to sit at the entrance uh, at the main reception to the museum so that they could greet visitors coming in and talk to them about their experiences. So we've got Les Charrington on the right and Arthur Jones on, on the left. Les was in the tank corps of the British Army in Tunisia in World War II when his tank was hit by a German shell. The shell ricocheted around inside and finished off everybody else except him and left him badly wounded. So he waited until after dark. He crawled out of the tank and across the ground to a slip trench, and he lay in there until around midday the following day when he was found by some New Zealand infantry. So he had a long recuperation and made a full recovery. Now Les is 101. He was 98 when this photo was taken. He's an active member of society, he doesn't wear glasses for reading or for distance vision, and he sings in a choir. So he's quite a remarkable man, and it was a great honour to have met him. Now, Arthur Jones on the left, he's about 94 now, and he was driving a tank during the D-Day invasion. This wasn't just any tank, this was a communications tank, and it had a wooden gun barrel so that it wouldn't be obvious to the, to the Germans uh, what its actual purpose was. So I'm not uh, too sure about what Arthur's exploits were, although you can Google him and uh, see that in great detail. Now, Arthur was a highly decorated veteran from, from uh, World War II, and hanging from the red ribbon on his chest is uh, the highest honour that the French government can bestow on anyone. Yes, that decoration is the Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, and uh, it's a wonderful honour for Arthur to have received that. 
he received it while I was working at Cosford. So look, thank you one and all, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the talk, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon when uh, the world's working again.